Welcome everybody. There's one source sheet, just one page. And today's class is dedicated by Dina Dornbush in loving memory and Leilu Nishmas, her dear friend Sarah Bas Reb Yaakov, Allah Vashalom of blessed memory, Tehei Nishmasai, Tzruda Bitzrer Hachayim, may his soul be bound up in the eternal bond of life and remain an eternal source of blessing and inspiration for you and the entire family and all of the Jewish people. Thank you very, very much. Somebody shared with me a, a beautiful story, really very, uh, extremely touching. They didn't know who wrote it. I don't know who wrote it, but someone, someone shared it with me. I want, to, uh, I want to share it with you for the beginning of the class. This fellow writes, he says that for years, says he and his wife dreamt of spending a beautiful Shabbos in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in Yerushalayim. And uh, this past weekend, after a lot of saving money and planning, they finally made this happen. So he writes, the hotel is stunning, the food was the next level, but I didn't expect the Shabbos morning that I had. He says, Friday night, they realized, he and his wife realized, that there was a very large contingency of colorful people staying at the hotel. And they didn't seem like the normal clientele, the regular clientele of the Waldorf Astoria in Yerushalayim. So he says, I politely made conversations with a couple of people. And I learned that this was a very large extended family. There was a, a father there. there, were, there, were, there were, this was a family of children who their father or son, parents, brother, was killed four months ago in Gaza. He was a soldier, he went into battle to protect his people and he was killed. His wife, the widow, was pregnant at the time. And last weekend, she gave birth to a baby boy. That Shabbos, the last Shabbos was the bris. The eighth day the baby was born on Shabbos, so the, the bris would be the next Shabbos. So uh, somebody you probably heard of him, uh, Reb Shaya Groucher. Groucher, yeah who is a very, very special and extraordinary human being and has shown up in the last few months in an unbelievable way for so many. So he invited the entire family, the extended family of the soldier who was killed, whose wife just had a baby, and booked them all into the Waldorf Astoria for the entire weekend and the entire Shabbos. He arranged the rooms and the meals and the mile and the entire, entire bris. He even arranged that visitors and VIPs and some distinguished people should come and join the bris. And uh, this fellow says he learned about this and he thought Reb Shaya himself would be there. <laughs> Reb Shaya Grauch, who arranged it, but he wasn't there. He was nowhere to be seen. There was, he says, signs everywhere about the bris and celebrating the bris. Of course, this baby born into a world without, without his father, only with his mother. There were candy bags given out to all the children on the hotel Friday nights. Everybody would have candies and bags. Everything was done beautifully, designed, class, uh, aesthetically beautiful, appealing. He says, Shabbos morning, he met Reb Shaya during the davening. And he sees that Reb Shaya Graucher is wearing a uh, hospital bracelet. So I asked him if everything was okay. He said that his wife had a baby girl, one <laughs> thirty in the morning. Friday night, Shabbos morning, 1.30 in the morning. So he obviously went to the hospital, as is the duty of a husband, got her settled, waited till the baby was born, and she was fine and everything was fine, and then he walked from the hospital <laughs> all the way to the hotel so that he should be able to join the bris Shabbos morning. So this fellow says what a bris it was. There were hundreds and hundreds of people came, family members, hotel guests, strangers who were in the hotel or heard about it through word of mouth, and everybody was singing songs. The mother said the blessing over the bris instead of the father, and she couldn't get the words out because of her tears. She ended up shouting out the blessing, and he said there wasn't a dry eye in the room, but a bris is supposed to be a happy occasion. So while everybody was crying, the Pshaya Graucher jumped up on a chair, and he started to sing songs of joy and celebration. And everyone spontaneously started to dance. 
the small circle got larger and larger as we grew to encircle the entire ballroom. And Apshaya, still standing on the chair, began the song, you know that song of He doesn't have the tune here in the text. But I think that's the song. Maybe it's. A <laughs> and uh, this song is very often sung on Simchas Torah, you know, during the Hakafas, which of course was shattered this year in southern Israel. And he says, nobody wanted the dancing to stop. There was just such a sense of oneness and, and unity and faith and power, spiritual power. Just nobody, you know, you just don't want the music to end. You don't want the singing to end. And he said, one hotel guest was a visitor from Toronto. And he turns to me, another guest, and says, this is the most beautiful and meaningful bris I've ever been at. None of us knew each other. But at this one moment, everybody was just family. And he says, after Shabbos, we were waiting for the valet to bring our car. We saw the mother, the new mother of the baby. She was being helped by her own mother as she wheeled a stroller with her newborn out the door with her own little kids following her, the new orphans, to face the reality of life as a newly single mom with little kids and a newborn. We wished her mazel tov and we knew that our connection is eternal. And he says, life isn't a fairy tale. But sometimes we see glimpses of how amazing our people and the world can be. That's his story of last Shabbos. So in this class, since it's the beginning of, of course, the month of Adr, Adr Sheni, so this week and next week, Be'ezer Hashem, we will be covering themes connected to the holiday of joy and festivity, of course, Purim. And uh, we're going to explore today another dimension of Purim. Like everything, sometimes we can fall prey to the external veneer of something and really not glimpse or touch the core of it. So we want to really get to a deeper understanding, not just intellectually, but also emotionally of Purim. And the way we'll introduce it is through a very, very strange story. The word strange really is the wrong word. It's beyond strange. Even the word bizarre, I don't think will we'll cut it. Um, maybe astounding, astonishing, uh, deeply, deeply enigmatic, and really disturbing, I should say, very disturbing. In fact, if you take the story at face value, literally as it says it, it's really unfathomable. It's very hard to believe. And yet, the Gemara records the story, and it's enshrined for eternity, and the Jewish people learn it. And uh, you would think, even if this happened, you know, <laughs> it should be deleted from the records. But the Gemara says it, and says it in the tractate that's dedicated to Purim. But really, when you scratch the surface, and you understand what's happening, you see it's a very different type of story, even though the language can be very misleading, like very often when you're talking about very deep concepts, if we don't have the context and the right approach, it can be very uh, misunderstood, and this is one of those classic examples. So let's see inside. There's a tractate of Mishnayis that's dedicated to Purim, it's called Megillah, Meseches Megillah, tractate Megillah. There's both the Mishnayis on it and the Gemara on it, and this includes all of the laws connected to Purim, and also a major part of it is a commentary on the Megillah itself, and deals with stories of Purim and this history of Purim and the laws connected to Purim. So on page 7, Megillah Dav Zayin Amid Beis, Tractate Megillah, page 7b, the Gemara says, and I quote, it's written in Aramaic, but you have here an English translation as well. Amar Rava. Rava said, Mechayev inish lebesumei bepuraya ad deloyada bein arur haman lebarach mardachai. Many of you have heard the term ad deloyada until you don't know. The, origi the origin of this term is from here. Rav says, one is obligated to become inebriated, libesume means to become intoxicated with wine, Rashi says with wine, on Purim, until he does not know how to distinguish between cursed is Haman and blessed is Mardachai. That's how powerful and intense and potent the inebriation is. That's what Rav says, this is the obligation of Purim. So the Gemara continues and backs it up or continues to tell a story. 
And here's the story. This is a story of two people who did justice. In fact, one of them was Rav's teacher, Rav's master. His name was Rabbah. Rabbah was the teacher of Rabbah. They lived in Babylonia, in, in present-day Iraq, from the great Amirayim, the great, greatest Talmudic sages of the time. So the Gemara now tells a story about two people. Rabbah and Rebzeira, Avdu, Seuda, Spurim, Bahadi, Adadi. Rabbah and Rebzeira, these are the names of two of the greatest sages, Babylonian sages of the time. They prepared a Purim feast to celebrate with each other. They decided to do the Suda together, the Suda's Purim. There's an obligation, of course, one of the mitzvahs of Purim, one of the four mitzvahs. In addition to reading, hearing the Megillah and Mishlai Achmanis, sending gifts to a friend, Matanis Lav giving charity, giving gifts to the poor. The fourth mitzvah of Purim is Mishta Simcha, a feast, a joyous celebration. And here they decided to do the meal together. What happens next? If so, if so means they became intoxicated, they became inebriated. That's what Aramaic if so means. Come, Rabbi. Rabbi arose, he stood up, Shachtelit Abzeda, and he slaughtered Rabzeda. Lemachar, the next day, Boi Rachami, Vaachiye. Rabbi asked Hashem for mercy, for compassion, and he brought him back to life. <laughs> he resurrected him. Achie comes from the word like Chayis, Tchia, Tchia, like Lachiyais. But Achie, he brought him back to life. He revived him. He, he re- resurrected him. Lashana, a year passes. The next year, Purim is coming. Everybody's thinking about Purim. So what happens? Amar Lei, Rabbi tells Reb Zayda, same two friends from last year. What does he say? Nesimar, let the master come. Vinavit so does Purim Bahadi Adadi, and let's once again celebrate the Purim feast with each other. Amalei, Reb Zayra says to him, says to Rabbi, Loi bechol shaita v'shaita misrachish nisa. Miracles don't happen every single hour. <laughs> and that's the end of the story. And here we move on. The story, mo- the Gemara moves on to the next discussion. That's the story. <laughs> so now you understand why I said it's a mind staggering story, literally on every level. The first level is what happened. Even not two of the greatest sages and leaders of the time, two regular people, <laughs> two regular Eden who gets intoxicated on Purim. Come, Rabbi Shachtel Rabzeda. Rabbi stood up and slaughtered Rabzeda. He killed another person. He killed another human being, killed another Jew during the Purim meal. That's how he celebrated Purim. It's unfathomable. It would be unfathomable about any single person. Not any person, but about most people that you know and that I know. Even when I am very, very, very tipsy and smashed and inebriated and drunk and intoxicated and good shikr. Even, uh, you're right. Nichnas yayin yotz soid. But what's what? What are the soidus? What are the secrets that came out? So this would be a question on anyone, especially Rabbi Chazal say he was literally from the greatest of the generation. The Gemara says loipasik pumim megirsa. He did not stop. His mouth did not cease from Torah for a moment. Rabbi once said about himself, the Gemara says in Brachas, I'm the example of a Benini, of an intermediary, an, an in-between Jew. Not a Tzaddik and not a Russia. And Rabbi said, you're not letting anybody live. His student and nephew said, you're not letting anybody live. You know, if, you, if, if you're the Benini, uh, what are we? And yet this is a story that the Gemara records about this person. And why did he kill him? Because he got drunk. What's equally strange is what happens next. Imagine there's a Purim meal and somebody slaughters somebody else. What do you think should happen at that moment? Huh? Hatzalah, okay. Hatzalah, Mesaskim, I don't know. Whatever. Maybe somebody should sober up, no? Lemachar, the next day. What happened to the next day? Oh, okay. The next day he decided it's time to daven. Lemachar. 
The next day he decides to start davening. In other words, he went to sleep in between. Or he was just continuing. He didn't go to sleep. He continued the, the, the meal, the fabregen. <laughs> in this situation. Now comes the third strange part. Next year. If you were Rabbah. I don't mean you, but if someone was Rabbah, right? Just think about it. Last year, it's like, I did it. I killed a guy. Somehow I managed to do this miracle of Tchiyas HaMesim, which is also unparalleled. Now you would think that people who are capable of asking Hashem and Davin and affecting resurrection, usually they're not murderers, even when they're drunk. But somehow we have to reconcile the two parts. Okay, next year, what would Rabbi be doing this whole year? <laughs> tshuva, more tshuva, more tshuva, more remorse. The last thing you would expect is, Nebzeda, why not another shot? Why not another meal once again? That's the last thing I would do. I don't hear Rabbi asking mechila, asking forgiveness. Maybe wearing a sackcloth. It says, Mordechai, right? Vayilbash, Mordechai put on a sack, fasted three days. Esther, everybody was fasting. Tshuva, <laughs> something called tshuva. Okay, he's alive, great, you can ask him forgiveness. It's almost like, Reb Zayda, wasn't that an awesome experience? Like, wasn't that the best Purim meal you had? Why not do it again? Such good experiences. And what about, it also it feels like I would be embarrassed like to even <laughs> show my face. Like, <laughs> you may want to avoid that person, even if you have to confront that person because you got to deal with the stuff. But to go voluntarily for a visit and say, come back, let me come to your house and pour him, come to my house and pour him. And yet he does it. He has no problem. What's equally strange is Reb Zayda's response. If you were Reb Zayda, if I was Reb Zayda, and this person would come and invite me to the meal, what should I say? <laughs> Thanks for the invitation. Go maybe invite another friend. Or I would suggest this Purim, you stay very, very dry and sober. If you need, grape juice is a wonderful alternative, although I would suggest celery juice. At best, if you want spinach juice, can work, or kale juice is also fine. But really, Rabbe, this is not what to, to do. Certainly, I'm not going to be there. It's not what he tells him. He says, you know, miracles don't always happen. He doesn't even address the horrific crime. In other words, if I would know that miracles happen constantly, okay, let's go, Pajalus, let's, let's go ahead. But since we know that miracles may not happen every morning, every day, every hour, I have to refuse. It's on him too. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a mitzvah, if naive, loy, sitein michshel, right? In front of a blind person, one is not allowed to put a stumbling block, which includes, in a more general way, that I'm not allowed to cause somebody to stumble morally. So really, if Reb Zayda would be coming, <laughs> that's what he should say. I'm not even allowed to do this. Rabbi, are you inviting me? Haven't you learned anything? Haven't you learned anything? No, I would be happy to come. Just don't, I don't know if there's going to be a miracle yet. Very good question. That's the key to the answer. <laughs> the word is slaughter, it's shachte. It's not usually the word for killed. The word in Aramaic for killed is katle. Katle, that's the word, katle. Here the word is shchita. We know what shchita means. And we know what it conjures in our image. That makes the story even more strange. He went and he shechted the bzeda? You know, you could say sometimes he fell, he dropped something, there was an accident. No, it was no accident. <laughs> From all the words the Gemara uses, could have used another word. He uses the word shchita, which is the word we use for animals, for shchita. Shchita means slaughtering. And there's a process of how you do shchita. And it's not the regular word to do. It's not killing is not that word. There's a word hemisa, there's a word katle, there's different words that don't indicate the particular method of slaughtering, which is done in a, what's called in Yiddish ashlachta, is a base shchita, slaughtering place. Obviously, this story has triggered the commentators over the generations to try to uh, <laughs> confront it. 
How are we supposed to deal with it? And not only that, the Gemara decides to put in the story. <laughs> in other words, it's such a, it's such a disturbing story. Like, and, and you don't even see a pras. Sometimes you have the story of David HaMelech and Bathsheba, for example. There's a lot of different ways of understanding that story. The Abar Benel, Don Yitzhak Abar Benel, was one of the great, uh, he was the finance minister of uh, Ferdinand and Isabella in Spain in the 15th century, and they offered him to stay in Spain even when the Jews were expelled because he was such an indispensable contribution for the, for the Spanish monarchy. But he refused. On Tisha B'Av, 1492, he left with all of his people. He wrote a, a very fascinating commentary on the whole Tanakh. It's a very long commentary. It's hard to learn that by now. It takes a lot of time. So in the story of David and Bathsheba, that Barbanel's objective is, that's exactly the point. The, the exact point is to tell you that a person is capable of making very serious mistakes and the key is to know how to apologize. The key is when Nasir Hanavi confronts David HaMelech, David's words are, Chatasi, I have sinned, unlike Shaul HaMelech. Now, there are many other perspectives on David. That's not our discussion. I want to bring out, I can understand sharing a story that's very, very disturbing to teach people what, we, what, humans are, what humans, even great people, are sometimes capable of. And that's why I have to be accountable. I have to be careful, conscientious. I have to be able to apologize. It's a very important lesson. It's an important lesson to know that people can fail. But that's not even the discussion here. I don't see a conversation of Rabbi like spending, you know, his time rectifying. It's like completely not, that's like, it's not even part of the conversation. It's almost like it's a great story. So the Mepharshim commentators struggle with this over the generations. Many naturally say, including the Marsha, the Marsha is one of the great commentators on Gemara. He was the Rav of Chelem. Chelem is not only a fictional uh, place. Chelem is a city in Poland. He was a rabbi there for nine years. His name was Marsha, Merenu Harav Shmuel Eliezer Edels. Edels was his mother-in-law's name. And uh, the Marsha says, Rabbeinu Yaivitz, the Yaivitz, says Rabbeinu Yaakov ben Sri, Rabbeinu Yaakov Emden, in his commentary, the Malbim and others, ready from the Me'iri, it doesn't mean literal. <laughs> it doesn't mean literal. It means he gave him too much to drink, and he got sick. He got very sick. He couldn't handle it. It was too much. And the next day... He saw how sick he was, so he davened. And va'ach, it doesn't mean he brought him back to life. It means he brought him back to health. That's what they explain. And we understand why they explain it. Because that already is a more containable, containable story. It happens. You know, a person has too much to drink. I didn't realize. I didn't estimate. I didn't know his body. And this happens. However... Everybody could see from the language of the Gemara that it's a very difficult explanation. Because shachte means slaughtered. <laughs> you don't say I slaughtered an animal, I made the animal sick. It doesn't say he wounded him, he made him sick. There's words for that too. So they say, yeah, the Gemara is just using a very, very intense expression. Maybe you could say the Gemara is trying to warn people. You make somebody sick, it can lead them to death. But no nonetheless, the simple language doesn't seem to indicate this was just an issue of he had a little too much to drink, the hangover was intense, or his body couldn't take it, and he fell ill, and maybe even a very serious illness. Even if you want to interpret that, why is he doing it next year again? <laughs> you learned your lesson, right? So why are you doing a suda with him? You saw what happened. You're not allowed to be, even if I don't kill somebody, I'm not allowed to be chayvul I'm not allowed to make somebody sick. It's an absolute prohibition to harm another person on any level. And of course, first and foremost, physically, it's also a prohibition. He goes again and asks again. The Chsam Seifer writes that Rabbi says in another place, in Masech Shabbos, that he was born in the Mazel Madim. Different days and different hours are connected to different Mazolis, planets, and he's connected to Madim, which is Mars. Madim comes from the word red. Ma'adim, dam. Because of Mars, the color red, why it's called Madim. And because he's connected to that planet, he has a bloody nature. That's what, it says. That's what he says about himself. And the Gemara explains that people who are sometimes born in that mazel and have certain tendencies, they have to choose because their aggression could come out in destructive ways or it can come out in positive ways. And he says you should consider being a mayal, you should consider being a shaykhit. So the Chsam Seifer says, oh, the two stories fit. Sorry, what did you say? A doctor, a surgeon, yeah, yeah. Not a teacher. 
please. You could teach other surgeons how to do surgery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't mean you, Chas Vashalom. You're an exceptional teacher, Emma. So it's very, 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 very nice einfall from the Chasam Seifer, but still, <laughs> being connected to a mazal, as the Rambam explains, doesn't mean that I'm forced to live a certain way. It means that I may have certain proclivities, certain instincts. We all know that from our lives. As a result of nature or nurture, or usually a combination of both, and sometimes factors that are conscious or unconscious, generational or personal, environment or internal, it, genetic, or things that we acquire as a result of our developmental experiences, we tend to follow certain patterns, certain natures. And that's not an excuse <laughs> For me, <laughs> to shecht another person, of course. Especially Rabbah, who was considered one of the tzaddikim of the generation. But again, even not a great tzaddik. Even a regular human being who's moral and decent and just a half a mensch. Not even a half a mensch, even a quarter of a mensch. Uh -huh. There were those over the generations who explained the whole story mystically. It's a metaphoric story. It's all written in code language. Now we have that concept. You have Midrashim. You have different stories that are explained by the Kabbalists as simply code language. But here it would be very difficult to explain this because this is brought in directly into the discussion of Halacha. This is not a section of Gemara that's dealing with homiletical, uh, spiritual, metaphysical interpretations. This is talking about the Halacha. Rav has said the Halacha and Purim is for a person to drink. And then the Gemara brings a story. So to say that the whole story is just a metaphoric story would be very, very difficult. Not only that, it's very interesting. Rabbeinu Nisim was one of the great Rishonim and the Baal Hamoyer, they both write that Rabbeinu Ephraim was one of the great Rishonim, said that the reason the Gemara tells the story is to cancel out what Rava said. Rava said, it's a chiyuv, it's an obligation to intoxicate, to become inebriated on Purim. The Gemara says, let me tell you a story, and that story will show you that this halacha was cancelled. In other words, this was Rava's view, it was not accepted because of what happened. If it's all a metaphoric, mystical story, they wouldn't cancel the halacha. Obviously, according to Rabbeinu Ephraim, this was a little a story. Now, most halachic authorities don't believe that this halacha was nullified. In Shulchan Aruch, in the Code of Jewish Law, Rav's statement about drinking on Purim is brought. <laughs> if this mamish happened, I would understand why everybody said, no, we're not doing this, don't get close to wine on Purim. And we understand, sometimes you see people doing much less than Shachteh, and still, mom is having a heart attack and a migraine already a week before Purim, and worried about what's going on, certainly when you have such a story. And yet, most halachic authorities didn't agree with Rabbeinu Ephraim. And the proof is Reb Zayda himself next year was offered this. In other words, they didn't cancel the halacha. That's what the pre says. So how are we to relate to the story? That it happened, and yet they didn't cancel the halacha, at least according to most authorities, and all the details that we discussed before. So I had the merit to hear an incredible explanation on this from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. I was a kid, still a kid, but I was a little younger. I still remember it. It was 1984, Tovshin Mem I was Mamish a kid, before Bar Mitzvah. And it was a Shabbos after Purim, Shabbos Shmini, I think it was, Shabbos Parsha Shmini, Tovshin Mem 1984 was the Shabbos after Purim. And uh, the Rebbe would have a Fabreng in Shabbos afternoon. And one of the talks, he started off with sharing the story in Gemara, asking all the questions, and then offering an explanation into the story. I have to say, even though I was young, and uh, my mind does tend to roam. Today there's a lot of names for that, but then, it was, <laughs> then there were no names for anything. But I could still remember when the Rebbe said the Sikh, it took a long time, he explained it, and then he continued the next Shabbos. 
I still remember how thousands of people were just glued. <laughs> the questions were so powerful. You know, I was wondering, like, how are you going to answer these questions? <laughs> However you, how are you going to answer these questions? The questions were so potent, so powerful, so overwhelming. How are you going to address it? When the Rebbe began then the explanation, it was so mesmerizing simply on an intellectual level, besides the emotional level. I could still see it and hear it, and the explanation is literally ingrained in my memory from that day. Even though I did look it up uh, this morning. <laughs> to, ref to refresh. And the truth is, the truth is, the nucleus of it, and he mentioned this in the writing, the nucleus of it is already found in the Shalom. The Shalom was one of the great sages who lived in, he was the Rav in Prague, Frankfurt, and then Yerushalayim, Rabbeinu Yeshaya Horowitz. Rabbeinu Yeshaya Horowitz, he lived in the 16th and 17th century. He's known as the Shalom because of his book, is called Shnei Luchai Sabris. And over there, and actually the section connected to Parshas Tetzava, he says a short little insight on this, which has the nucleus of this explanation. And to show you the precision in every word of Chazal, the Rebbe based it on one word. One word was shachte, like you said, slaughtered, but one more word that doesn't seem, that seems superfluous. We wouldn't, we wouldn't make a big deal of it, but if every word is precise, you should. And that is, it says, Rabbi and Abzeda had a meal together. They became intoxicated. If some, they became intoxicated. And then the word is kam rab. What does kam mean? He stood up. Now, you may say he stood up, I don't know, because it's easier to shecht somebody standing than sitting. But is that really relevant? And if he did it sitting? And if, if Reb Zayda put his head down on his lap or was sitting near him? You say, well, it happened to me, he stood up. Why does the Gemara mention that? Kam rab, rab stood up. And then the word, as we said, shachte, he slaughtered him. It also says ipsum, they both became intoxicated. The truth is, the story is about whose intoxication? Not Reb Zayda. The story is about Rabbah's intoxication. He's the one who did this. Now, naturally, <laughs> if Reb Zayda wouldn't have been intoxicated, it probably would have been a fight, a serious fight. And if Rabbah prevailed, this would have been truly cruel, extra cruel. Even though the story, the way it is, is so difficult to understand. But the Gemara emphasizes ifsum. They both became intoxicated. Even though that's not the, that's not the core of the story. The core of the story is Rabbah. What happened to the Bzeda happened to the Bzeda. Rabbah is the one who was ifsum. He's the one who did it. Come Rabbah shachtel the Bzeda. All of these are little, little clues, little hints to, uh, to open us up to what's really happening in this story. And this also gives us another insight. You're talking about Purim. Purim is considered one of the greatest to the greatest day of the year. Not only that, it says in Svarim that Yom HaKippurim, it says in Zoya, Yom HaKippurim is called Kippurim. Which means that Yom, Yom HaKippurim is Kippurim, it's like Purim. In a way, Purim is even greater than yet. In other words, in some ways, Yom HaKippurim is like Purim. So that means that in some ways, Purim has something that even Yom Kippur doesn't have. Imagine somebody would tell you, I went Yom Kippur to Shul, and the people were doing tshuva and davening. It can't sit in in our shaman. Imagine a Jew comes in Kippur to Shul and he's davening and, and the, the, the doing tshuva and then you say in the middle of that what happened? He went over to somebody and he shechted him. It's unfathomable. And here it's on Purim. Such a powerful day in terms of holiness that suddenly turns the whole Purim into not just a bash but a dangerous, dangerous bash where such cri criminal behavior can happen, like what, 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 are they, what are we trying to teach people? What are we trying to teach our children? 
Some of you have a hard enough time with Purim without such stories happening. Just teenagers drinking and whatever. I'm not going to get into it at the moment. And you know how you feel about it. So, and I, frankly, some people really don't like Purim because of this. They feel it's just wild and, and frivolous and ridiculous and absurd. You're nodding. <laughs> Never mind the Shalachmanis pressure, but even in the old way, the Shalachmanis, the way they did it, they, the way they did Shalachmanis 40 years ago when your mother took a brown bag, put an orange in the bag and a hamantash and gave it to her neighbor and her neighbor put in, I don't know, an apple and another hamantash and that was the end of Shalachmanis. Even without the pressure of Shalachmanis, but this aspect of Purim makes people queasy and for good reason. Because very often, drinking, when it's not done by a mature, responsible person in the context of sensitivity and holiness, is just a release of, of, of animalistic tendencies and drives and, and irresponsibility and people, whatever, everything that happens when people get drunk, you have to be very careful. And here we have this in the most extreme fashion, it's just recorded. So what do you want from your teenager? <laughs> In order to understand this, we have to go to another story and then come back. And this is the famous story of Nadav and Aviyu. Nadav and Aviyu were the two sons of Aaron. And on the day that the Mishkan was dedicated, the day that the Mishkan was put up for the first time, Rosh Chaydesh Nissen, a year after the exodus of Egypt, Matthias Mitzrayim happened the year 2448 since creation. A year later, almost the first anniversary, two weeks before the first anniversary, the Mishkan was put up, Rosh Chaydesh Nissen. And it was literally one of the greatest moments in history. Chazal say it was as great as creation. Creation of heaven and earth was, so to speak, happened once again through the creation of the Mishkan. First was God, Hashem, creating a home for the human. And the Mishkan was the human being creating a home for Hashem. And the great people representing this story were Aaron, the high priest, and his four sons, Nadav, Aviyu, Allah, and Esama. And on that great day, tragedy struck, and the two sons of Aaron, Nadav, and Aviyu passed away. The Torah is very, very uh, ambiguous about what happened exactly. It says in Parsha Shmini that the two sons of Aaron offered an Eish Zara Shalot Siva Oisam. They offered an alien, they created an alien fire that they were not commanded, and they passed away. But Tetzay Eish Melifne Hashem, there was a fire that consumed them. And here again, exactly what happened. What were the circumstances? So the Ur HaChayim, Rabbeinu Chayim, but not the Chayim, in Parshas Shmini, Parshas Acherei Mois, actually, interprets the words, it says, Vaydabra Hashem al Moshe Acherei Mois, Shnei Bnei Aram, Mekarvosam Lefnei Hashem Vayamusu. Hashem spoke to Moshe after the death of the two sons of Aram, when they came close to God and they died. Why does the Pasuk say that? So the Ur HaChayim says, the Torah is trying to tell you what happened. It was a story of Karvosam Lefnei Hashem. Let's see the Ur HaChayim. The third, the, the second source in your source sheets. Ayoimer ach al za aderech achere mois. Dibri Hashem le moisha derech misasam. Hashem explained to Moshe how they passed away. Shahoy sal za aderech be karvasam lifne Hashem. It came from their closeness to God. Pidush, shenisqarvu lifne oir ha elyon bechibas ha kaidish ubaza mesu. They came close to the divine light with a love of holiness, and that's how they expired. Rambam's Akas of the Torah is, is intimating, is explaining haflas chibas atzadikim, the wondrous love and affection of these people, of these great people. Shagam shahu margishim b'misosam, even though they felt that their bodies will not be able to contain this. Loi nimnu mikroiv. Listen to words. Ledveikus neimus arevus yedidus chavik vuz chashekus mesikus at klois nafsha mehem. Those who know Lashem Kodesh, the words of the Rechaim, you could see that he almost can't contain himself. Despite the fact that they, they knew their bodies won't contain, might not contain this, they did not prevent themselves from getting close. And he used the words dveikus. Dveikus means attachment. Neimos, pleasantness. Areva, sweetness. Yedidus, kinship, friendship. Chavivus, love. Chashekus, desire. Mesikus, sweetness. To experience the full presence of the Shekhin, of the Divine, until their souls said, 
this is too intense and the soul just expired this you need to understand this quality this experience I can't describe the quality of it it's beyond articulation and words it's beyond something that we can recognize not from any human being I can't even put it in words it can't come from the ma- the mouth doesn't have the words for it and the quill doesn't have the words for it. It won't even be comprehended with a brain that is attached to the material and therefore has a hard time even grasping what I'm saying. But when a person experiences this internally in a great measure, Tigal the soul cannot be contained in the flesh. And it leaves and it returns to the home of its father. What is Dara Chaim teaching us here? Dara Chaim says something, then he says, I can't explain it. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about it, I'm not going to write about it, because you're not going to understand it. But he still writes about it. Because <laughs> he wants us to know something here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What is Dara Chaim really explaining? It's not something we talk about so much. But the reason we don't talk about it is not necessarily for the right reasons. And I'll explain what I mean. I'm going to ask Hashem to allow me to become a channel for this because this, uh, this is not such an easy thing to talk about. The ultimate experience of Yiddishkeit is about absolute bliss. We often, I get a lot of emails from people, a lot of questions from people. How do I reconcile the need and the desire to have a joyous life with all of the demands of life, the duties of life? Especially as a mother, as a wife, or as a husband, or as a father, or as an adult, or as a teenager trying to grow up, all these duties and responsibilities, especially all the religious duties and responsibilities. In other words, people are often struggling to reconcile between our desire for joy, for elation, for calmness, for simcha sachayim, and yet there's so many responsibilities and there's so much guilt connected to religion. I'm doing this wrong, and whoever gets things right, you know that person? Perfection is, is, is fiction. That means if guilt is my default mode, there's always room for it. And that's very important. Sometimes, I was telling this to somebody, sometimes people feel terrible shame or guilt about something, right? You do something and then you, I didn't do it right. There's always that self-blame. So I told somebody the other day, I said, I want you to understand something. Your guilt or your shame or all the negative voices you're having has nothing to do with what happened. Your guilt and shame is waiting to come out. Anything you do, boom, it pounces. It's literally like a predator, like a cheetah. I don't know if you watch documentaries of cheetahs and and lionesses and tigers. They wait. (laughs) They wait. (laughs) They don't have... it's not about this there, that there, that there. That's, that's God's cheshbonus. They, they need to eat. Okay? So they wait. This is the deer. Boom! And actually the deer know that. Because when deer get away, they don't sit for the next 10 years and say, what did I do so horribly to deserve this? Only we do that to ourselves. The deer are smart. They don't have a meshugana yetzakar say crank. You like that, yeah? Yeah. That's why we have deer here. They're supposed to teach us how to live a little bit. They don't sit and say, Mommy, uh, no. In fact, we know that when a predator attacks an animal, a mammal or another animal, and they get out of it, either they freeze or they manage to run away. So before they join the herd, they shake for like, I think, 30 seconds or a minute. And they basically shake off the physical trauma, the physical, and then they go back to the herd and they're normal. <laughs> it's not 30 years later, they're still struggling with identity. They yeah, they do, they do instinctive somatic, because it's in the body. If not the body, the body can capes it. 
But what happens with many of us is our mind comes into the picture. And the mind has a story. I'm horrible, I'm ugly, I'm sick, God hates me, the world hates me, life hates me, I'm not deserving, I'm undeserving. So now the rest of my life I'm busy compensating for that void. So I told this person, the guilt and the shame is inherent. It's just waiting for the right moment. You said something? Oh, stupid, you're so unintelligent, you're so illiterate, you're so immature. Do you know how people are thinking about you after you said that? I mean, why don't you just shut your mouth, and remain quiet forever, and then, you're, are you sure, then you'll have self-love. Nothing to do, I'll prove it to you. The next day, something else happens. <laughs> and the same voice. It's not about what happened. It doesn't say that to it. It doesn't say the truth. It doesn't say, I am here to destroy you. <laughs> I am here to make you feel worthless. I'm not here for that. No, I'm here. I'm the, I'm the tzaddik. I'm the one to protect you. I'm the one telling you the truth. That's its power. The power is that it speaks in the name of truth. So when sometimes we have an inborn tendency, and it's not necessarily inborn, very often it's developed, we have to be able to distinguish and to be able to look at it and with compassion observe all those voices without falling prey to the teeth and jaws of that cheetah inside of me that's ready to mow me at any moment. As a result of this, there's also conceptions that are ingrained in us, and it's not anybody's fault or judgment. On the contrary, the Jewish people have, life is not a fairy tale, as this person wrote. And the difficulties and challenges are so real that one needs a constant uh, tune-up to be able to tune into this. But what is the Rechaim really teaching us here? The Rechaim here is teaching us that the experience of divinity, the experience of Hashem, by definition, is an experience of infinite bliss. David HaMelech says in Tehillim, Tamu uru'u kitoiv Hashem. Tamu uru'u kitoiv Hashem. There's a story that the Balatanya, the Alter Rebbe, once went, came to Shklov and he went into the Shul and he went to the Bima and he gave a clap in the Bima and he said in a niggin, Tamuru kitoi vashem, farzucht vetirizen, as der eibrishter is gut. Tamu, taste, and you will see kitoi vashem. This means as follows If my visceral experience, I'm going to be honest now, if my visceral experience of Hashem, is loaded with negativity, with toxicity, with just with pressure. It's like, oh, 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 like six washing machines placed on my shoulders. That's my visceral experience. So obviously, David HaMelech is saying, I'm worshipping an idol. I have the wrong God. Tamu. You know, when you say, taste the food, you'll see it's delicious. I don't have to convince you. <laughs> taste it, you'll see. That's what David HaMelech says, Tamu. Taste it. Uru'u, you'll see ki toiv Hashem. What if I taste it and taste it and taste it and taste it and it's horrible? So I reach one of two conclusions. Either it's Hashem, it's, it's really, I don't see the toiv Hashem. Or I just blame myself. But there's also a third element. And that is that there are blockages not allowing me to experience the authentic relationship with Hashem. I want to give you another source, and this comes unexpectedly from the Rambam. The Rambam, people like to describe him as the ultimate rationalist. The Rambam was Isha Seichel. He was organized and structured, and his philosophical work, Meir Nevuchim, Guide to the Perplexed, is so intellectual and rational. And the Rambam cherishes the gift of the mind and the intellect of Seichel. But here I want to show you another part that people don't know, know about the Rambam. In Hilchis Truva Perik Yud, he describes what love looks like, what Avas Hashem looks like. This is a direct quote from the Rambam, Rabbeinu Moshe ben Maimon. Your next source, Rambam Tshuva Perik Yud. V'keitzad hi ha'ava haru'uya. What does real Ava, what does real love look like? Hu sheyoya ves Hashem Ava g'doyla yisere azama oid. One experiences a love of Hashem that is great. Yisere means overflowing, aza, intense, ma'oid, excessively intense, 
to the point that one's soul is bound up in this love of Hashem. To the point that the person is always perpetually immersed in it. It's almost like a person, it's like a person is love sick. Like a person is sick. Somebody is sick. It's 24, you know, a person has a bad flu or a bad infection. It's 24 7. There's almost like it's so intense. It could be like I'm, I'm, I'm sick with love. It's so intense. And here he's referring to a particular type of love sick. And it's fascinating that the Rambam gives the next example. And I know it could be a little uncomfortable. But I want to explain to you why he gives this example. Because the Rambam is trying to show people what a visceral experience is like. And he gives an example you wouldn't expect the Rambam to give, but he gives this example. A person who's sick with love towards another human being. This means, not I like somebody, not even I love somebody, I'm sick about somebody. <laughs> I'm crazy. It's not just a crush or attachment. It's an overwhelming, intense experience. And he says, This man, this person who is having a feeling, it's not a feeling once in a while. His mind cannot get off. He cannot divert his mind from the love of this person, of this woman. He is immersed in this person, thinking, connecting to this person constantly. When he's sitting, when he's standing, when he's eating, when he's drinking. In other words, it touches me so deeply, I eat and I think about it, and I drink and I think about it, and I sleep and I think about it, I take a walk and I think about it, I can't get my mind off you say, you know what, you need help. <laughs> <laughs> One second. So listen to his words. You think this is bad. You think this is bad or fun? Yes, Hashem, for those who get it, is even stronger. That's what Shloyma says. I am lovesick. And that's why if you open the book, the Shir Hashirim, and you learn Shir Hashirim, eight chapters, it's filled with intense imagery. Shashirim is not a philosophical, intellectual work. It's extremely, it's graphic, it's sensual, it's visceral, it's very body-oriented. What's this? And suddenly it became a holy book. In fact, there's an there's a, there's a opinion in Mishnayis, Meseches Yedayim, some of the sages said, Shashirim is not part of the Kisvei HaKodesh. It fell into the Tanakh by mistake. <laughs> there's an opinion like that. And who responded? Amar Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva said, Chas v'shalom to say this. And Rabbi Akiva went as far as to say, all the other svarim are kodesh. Shir Hashirim is kodesh kadosh. That's what Rabbi Akiva says. All the other books are holy. Shir Hashirim is holy of all. So thought there were those who wanted to dismiss it, delete it. <laughs> all was a control, all delete. And Rabbi Akiva says, on the contrary, what did I say? No, 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 you said control, control, all delete. That's what they taught me. Re reset. Exactly. It's what? Yeah, yeah, very good. Very good. I told you, you're a good teacher. She said, Shir Hashirim does not have Hashem's name in it. That's what's so surprising. And there's no moral instruction. It doesn't say there, you know, it doesn't say anything about Hashem, about morality, about ethics, about Midas Toiv. It's nothing. It's a story about a shepherd who's out in the field and he meets somebody. You know, why wasn't he in yeshiva? I don't know. I don't know why he wasn't in yeshiva. That's the first question on Sher Hashem. He's out in the field in the shepherd and it's springtime in Eretz Yisrael. You know, it's beautiful. Right, the winter, the Shoshim describes this. The winter is gone. You can hear the doves, the doves and the pigeons, you know, they're all preparing to lay, eh, to make nests and build a new family. It's the vibe, exactly. It's the, and we know which vibe he's talking about. And I have my dove who's hiding behind the clefts of a rock. 
Beseser Madrega on the hidden step. And the shepherd says, Hareini es marayi, chashmeini es koilech, ki koilech arei v'marech nava. I want to see your face, I want to hear your voice. The voice is so pleasant, the countenance is so gewaldic, nava, so beautiful. And the whole shir hashirim, ani l'doidi v'doidi li, and it gets very detailed, very intricate. So that's what they said, what does it have to do with the Tanakh? What does it have to do with Tanakh? It's a love poem, great, what's it have to do with Tanakh? So Shira Bakiva said, it's Kodesh Kodashim. Hashem's name is mentioned at the end once. Rishafer, Rishvei, Eishal, Heves, Yutke. There's one more Sefer in Tanakh that Hashem's name is not mentioned in. Which one? Megillah Esther. Esther. Both in Ksuvim. Megillah says doesn't even have Hashem's name even once. Also very strange. It's part of the Tanakh. Put in Hashem's name once. Not once. Also fascinating. And here there's a common denominator. What Rabbi Akiva is teaching is exactly what the Rambam, this is what the Rambam is articulating here. What Rabbi Akiva is teaching is the most powerful bliss that people have on earth. And I'm not talking about fictional bliss that I would call complete a distraction from your real life. I'm not talking about that. Because that comes and goes very fast. It's called a distraction. But let's say there's a moment of true, true, deep, deep belonging and connection. Not a crush, not a distraction, not something that's taking me away from my real life and I'm just literally escaping my responsibility. Tomorrow I'm going to wake up, it's going to be a nightmare. But I'm talking about a moment of real connection and relationship where a person's heart is swelling from what the words of the Erechayim says, Ne'imus, Yedarevus, Yedidus, Chavivus, Chashekus, Mesikus. I remember when the Rebbe was calling the Erechayim, he said the Erechayim is Nifla Sheben Nifla. The words of the Rechaim are wondrous beyond wondrous. What Rabbi Akiva is telling us is, all this is just a mirror, a reflection of your relationship with Hashem. That's where the infinite bliss is. And if you remember, a few weeks ago, we learned a story about Rabbi Akiva. You remember? We were, they were watching the great magic happening in Rome. All the sages were weeping. Rabbi Akiva was laughing. And Rabbi Akiva said... And we learned from Tairari Parshish Tzatzah, Rabbi Akiva was saying, if this is the type of joy that exists, after Shvira Sakelem, after the divine energy comes down and falls and goes through millions of filters and concealments, and still there's such a party, imagine when I'm tuning in to the source of the bliss, the source of all the bliss is the Ein Saif, the source of all that. So imagine when I'm tuned into that place, the joy is indescribable. What is this joy? It's not a joy that something I like, I'm getting. What we often call is, I want to be happy. I want this. It's, I'm looking for something else that's going to satisfy me. But that, that's not the essence of simcha. Because that's something that's very, very vulnerable. When I have it, I'm happy. When I don't have it, I'm not happy. As long as it's entertaining, I'm happy. So yeah, we all do that. <laughs> but it's a very, very skin-deep form of a celebration. The truest form of simcha, of bliss, is what the Ramam is describing here. And the truth is, we need to talk about this more, I think. We need to teach it more. Most importantly, we have to find tools. Because it's not about intellectual. He's not talking about intellectual. It's just not a philosophy class. Here. What happens so often to Judaism is becomes philosophy. We talk about things. We know how to do everything. And it's important because halacha is the bedrock of Yiddishkeit. That's why we're here. Torah and mitzvahs. But often we're deprived of, and our children are deprived of, it's not just children, adults all the way. I'm not talking, I'm not talking here only about children. Is the visceral, emotional experience of a blissful relationship with infinity. I know I put in a lot of words into that sentence. How do you do it? Yeah. So actually, it's not what about what we do. It's about what we don't do. Because the soul is a chelek elekam imal mamash. The soul is a derivative of infinite consciousness. And because Hashem is the source of all pleasure and love and all bliss and all joy. Because let's understand, all the love I have in my heart, all the love anyone in this room or anyone in the world has in their heart. Imagine you bring every mother... Okay, into a room and you get the love that exists in every single mother's heart to her children. How much love would that be? Just in this room. Never mind in the whole city. Never mind in the state. Never mind in the world. 
Every mother's heart, if you can extract all the love, how much love would we have? Infinite. Infinite. And what if we can bring in all the mothers of all the generations? A lot, right? And we... Pretty all in common, pretty intense. Imagine intense stuff. And imagine you put that all into one heart. <laughs> That's intense stuff. Now, now understand, where did all that love come from? A mindless cell after 26 billion years one day started to feel love? Tell me, how does that happen? If this table evolved for another 16 billion years, I, I'm not going to watch it happen. They once asked a turtle if it remembers, you know, from the Big Bang and everything. He said, it all happened so fast, he doesn't know. <laughs> so if you have the patience of a turtle, maybe. Is this going to develop consciousness <laughs> after like a billion years? A mindless cell doesn't develop conscious. Consciousness is a gift. Consciousness comes from consciousness. <laughs> love comes from a lover. So all this love in every mother, where does it come from? I'm saying mothers. Of course, I mean also fathers <laughs> and every person who has love. I'm not discriminating against the love of fathers, chas v'shalom. It all comes from where? It comes from Hashem. <laughs> That's the source of all the love. That's the source. It's the only source. There's no love somewhere else. There's not a vending machine called love. I put in a dollar and I get it. So when the soul is tuned in, when I plug in my neshama, it's like a plug. When I plug my soul into the source and I become a channel, then the experience of bliss is beyond comprehension. But here's the challenge, all the other thoughts. <laughs> Even if I want to start doing that, first of all, I have to believe I have this. I have to develop a relationship with my soul. And then there's all the other parts in me that even if I start doing this, there's so many other distractions. And all of those distractions have a common denominator. And that is, they don't allow me to experience myself as a conduit for infinity. And this is where Nadav and Aviyu were searching for one thing. It's called the death of ego. The death of ego is when a person begins to live. As long as my ego is alive, I'm dead. As long as when my ego can, go goodbye, can say goodbye, I begin to live. Because what is the ego? As we often say, ego is easing God out, easing greatness out, eliminating God's outlet, because I'm an outlet for Hashem. These are just all new acronyms of ego. The one who made the word didn't know about these Russian Tavison, but it's fine. What does ego mean? I'm substituting ultimate reality with counterfeit reality. Now I do it. <laughs> That's what life is. That's what Avedis Hashem means. Avas Hashem is not I'm just going to start loving something that's so beyond, I don't even know what you're talking about. Avas Hashem means tuning in to the miracle and gratitude of this moment of me, my soul, being a channel for Ein Saif. And that's the truth of this moment. That's the truth of every moment. This doesn't mean I'm not a responsible person. The ego says, oh, you're going to talk about this too much, so we should all... So no laundry today, no dinner today for the kids. Very nice, because you're busy. No, it's the opposite. It's showing up to life without ego. It's showing up to life as a conduit. I show up much more. I'm much more creative because I'm plugged into the source of creativity. And that's what it means, a relationship with Hashem. Imagine a refrigerator tells you, you know what, as I told you once, a refrigerator tells you, you know what, I'm enough. I had enough being plugged into the wall. I want to be independent. Do me a favor. Get rid of that plug. Pull me out. I want to go on my own. So you know what I did? I unplugged the refrigerator. You know what happened? I had to call the Hever Kadisha for the food. Everything was spoiled. Everything was rotten. And the poor refrigerator had no life anymore. And then the refrigerator told me, Ah, Rabbi, why, why? I didn't realize I was plugged in in order to channel the electricity. You got it. You weren't plugged in to be enslaved. You were plugged in to be alive. When I plug in my computer or my phone, I'm not trying to limit my computer. I'm trying to make it alive. <laughs> I'm trying to get it channeled. Plugging in, Avayda Hashem means plugging into what? Plugging into you, to the source of life, which is the source of all bliss and joy. That's what Bittal means. That means the more I can allow my ego to subside, to surrender, to calm down, the more I can open myself up to become the best friend of my soul, which is a channel. And then I become a creative channel for Hashem because the I 
doesn't create a chatzitza, doesn't interpose between me and the source. The Rambam says here, like the Rechaim says, when a person experiences this level of self, you know, sometimes people say, I, I wanna, I'm searching for myself. Who am I? I want to find me. The worst thing I can do for myself is <laughs> try to find it. The, <laughs> don't take this wrongly. This is not about denigrating yourself. On the contrary. The worst thing I can do for myself is try to find it and put it in a frame <laughs> and turn it into something. The greatest form of selfhood is when the self is a channel for infinity because then the self is infinite. When it's plugged in to the source of all life. So my mind, my heart, my soul, my love, my creativity, my warmth, my passion, my authenticity is just channel through me. It's Hashem's love, Hashem's passion, Hashem's wisdom, Hashem's creativity, Hashem's life force. It's being channeled. I'm a channel. And then you're a channel for Ein Soif. Shluchay shal Adam Kamaisa. You're a shliach of Hashem. So the soul is in this natural state of love, of, of, of connection, of attachment. The greatest challenge is to let go of all the things that say, I will fill you up in your detachment. Unplug and I will give you a life. And then I'm always running from one thing to another thing. It's never enough. You know why? Because the poor refrigerator is dead. It's trying to create a counterfeit life. <laughs> it's very hard for the refrigerator to say, you know what? I'm done. I'm done being miserable. I'm done being a refrigerator that has to be its own master. I'm done. I'm finished. Like somebody once told me about somebody. He's a self-made man and he worships his creator. <laughs> it's very hard. <laughs> I'm not self-made and I will worship my creator. Because when I worship my creator, that means I, I am an extension of the creator. That relationship is nothing but blissful. Now this does not mean that there's no pain in life. Of course there's pain in life, there's a lot of pain in life. And maybe when a person experiences this level, the pain actually is more acute because one actually feels intensely how light is being eclipsed in the falsehood of the world and we grieve for it, we mourn for it. But all this pain is in context of how much love there is. And I'm not going to give up on the source of love just because I don't understand, just because I don't comprehend. The soul doesn't have to understand. God is not an intellectual mathematical formula. The soul needs attachment, connection. It's like uh, David HaMelech compares himself to a little baby in the, womb, uh, in, the, in the arms of its mother, right? He says, One of the most powerful verses in Tehillim. He says, I am in a state of doimim, silence. I'm like, my soul is like gomel, like a suckling infant being embraced by the mother. You ever saw, I don't have to tell this to this crowd, but you watch a little baby, right? In that calmness. You know, and you could see the baby just finished eating. Of course, you're exhausted. You didn't sleep already for nine months. But I'm talking now about the baby. You're exhausted. The baby just burped and had gegessen shalashudis already, already three times in the same hour. And, and, and you look at the baby's eyes, right? And you could see a certain serenity. David HaMelech, who had a very hard life. <laughs> he was a warrior. He struggled. You mean read Tehillim. Read his story in Tanakh. David HaMelech had a hard life. Ki avi ve'imi azavuni v'ashem yasvein. Everyone who saw him wanted to kill him. This kid, he finally, got, he finally had a great wife, Michal. And her father decided she's going to kill him. He's going to kill her. So, the man was a fugitive. His life wasn't blissful. But yet... He was anchored in something. Nafshi kagamul alei He had that innocence of a little, that, that six-month-old baby in the arms of its mother who doesn't understand, doesn't understand, but has a trust. That's not intellectual. That's visceral. That's real. That's emotional. For this, I need a lot of self-awareness. I have to be able to watch all those other voices coming up in my body that want to take me away from this. And today, our generation has been blessed with much more awareness in trying to help people connect to deeper parts of themselves, help bypass all the wounds and coping mechanisms that don't allow me to really experience my infinite love. And I know in my life, I, I, shared, this, I shared with this your few that I'm giving an example of myself, even though it may not apply to many people. But I simply want to give a real example. I think everybody can use it in whatever your own stuff are. 
I give a lot of classes. I speak a lot, unfortunately, maybe. My kids still want to know what I do for a living. And I'd never know what to say. And one of my children, <laughs> once, during the time of Corona, everything was Zoom, right? It was Gam Zoom Lataiva. So this was a very funny story. So uh, in my office, in my house, that's where I did all my Zooms. And uh, there were a lot of Zooms with teenagers. <laughs> And, and of course, there were a lot of Zooms about teenagers, right? What else is there to talk about? So, uh, and you know, sometimes I speak a little loud. So my voice was going up to one of the bedrooms. So when I finished, one of my children came down and said, Ta, what was that about? I said, I was giving a, a shear. So my child says, about what? So I said the truth about raising teenagers. So this child starts laughing, ha, 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 and they're listening to you? <laughs> they're listening to your advice? What do you know about this? <laughs> it was great. It was Gavaldic. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. And what did you I listened. I listened, yeah. I paused and I breathed and I listened. <laughs> That's the most important thing. And then this child went to my wife and says, Ma, you won't believe what Tati is doing. He's talking about raising teenagers. Ha 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 ha. It wasn't even anger, it was such a joke. It was like such a mockery of reality. It's like, what's next? You're going to talk about what it feels like being an elephant, what it feels like being a star, a black hole, a galaxy, maybe a penguin. Like, what's, you know, what's coming next? Like, what else are you an expert in? <laughs> I know in, so I'm, give, I'm giving this metaphor because it's personal, but I think it really bring, at least brings out so, some of this. If I'm giving a class, I have to give a class, I try to prepare. I want to get up and say something. I could do it in two ways. One is, I could focus so much on preparing. And I need that it should be a perfect product. And I need that the people should be blown away. And it should be impressive. And get a standing ovation. And afterwards, they should tell me it was a life changer. And then, ah, I'll have value. You know the problem with this? It's miserable. You know why it's miserable? Because there's never a perfect class. There's no such a thing. Even if you think it was, you better. <laughs> I know. My brain, remember, trauma is just waiting what to come out on. There's always a chisarin. You ever saw a perfect bar mitzvah? Tell me, you made a wedding for your daughter. You worked a lot. Was it perfect? No, the napkins were the wrong color. Let's face it. And there was not enough meat for everybody. Some people got chicken. Let's face it. And one guy in the band showed up late. And then he decided he forgot where the chup is. He went to the wrong hall. He went to Borough Park. I don't come home and say, wow, my daughter is married, a beautiful chas and kvaldik. I need that to come out. That element has to attack. It's miserable. What if my attitude is completely different? I'm not even teaching. <laughs> this is not about me. Every person needs to know what Hashem chose them for in this world. My job is to show up with the tools I have today to become the channel I am capable of being today. Tomorrow, I may acquire new, new, new tools. Tomorrow, I may realize that the tools of yesterday were flawed. They were. <laughs> and I'll say, okay. And maybe I'll, may maybe I'll make a mistake too. And I'll have to correct it. But I can only show up with the tools I have today. It's not me, my ego at stake, my personal worth at stake. If my personal worth is coming because you're giving me a standing ovation, you know how deep my personal worth is? Zero, shabba, zero, shabba, zero. The next time I don't get a standing ovation, I'm worthless and I'm looking at the whole world for validation. Could you give me a standing ovation? Oh, you could? Great. Get up on the chair. Do me a favor. It's a miserable way of life. But if my ego is what's navigating myself, that's what it has. Standing ovations, validation, whatever that looks like in your life. 
I need the validation, I need the compliment, I need somebody to tell me I'm good. And when someone criticizes me, OMG. No, I'm not telling you that you shouldn't compliment me anymore. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> but there's two ways. Of course we like, there's two ways. There's receiving feedback, which helps a person grow. Meaning realizing this is what can change, this is what can be enhanced. And then there's feedback that defines the self. A person wants to be able to go to a state where criticism and compliments have nothing to say about who I am, essentially. They may tell me about what type of teacher I am, where I can improve, I should be sh speak shorter. That's good feedback. <laughs> of, it's a recipe for everything. The more, but it's hard because the wounds, the coping mechanism doesn't like this. The coping mechanism comes in and says, what do you mean? But, but who are you? You, 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 need the, you need this. I don't need it. When I'm divorced from my soul, I need it. <laughs> when I'm in touch with my soul, I don't need any of this. Why don't you need it? Because the very fact that I need is already a form of death. The Tzamech Tzadik, the grandson of Baal once said one of the most powerful things. And you have to take this with sensitivity because it's very deep. He said, what is entitled is often a punishment called kares, v'nichrisa ha-nefesh. The soul gets cut off. He says, what does that really mean? He said two words. When a person says, ich daf, I need. It means... I'm not fully, fully alive. Much deeper than I need is, Hashem needs. The real I is completely one with the source. Ein oid mulvadai. Now, I know I live in a world where I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. I get it. But that's not where my joy is coming from. That's where my joy is filling a void through pursuing something else that's not intrinsic. That was easy for him. <laughs> I've got to give the other guy lessons. <laughs> I know exactly the same thing. You've got to give him credit. But he doesn't linger. I once said, there's a line in Tanya, the Balatanya writes, chapter 22, the Gemara says that arrogance is like Avoy Zara. He says, why is arrogance like Havai Dezara? I could be an arrogant person and believe in God. I'm not serving idolatry. So he says, it doesn't mean arrogance is like serving a pagan statue. But he says, what's the shirish of all Havai Dezara? What's the, what's the root of Havai Dezara? The root of Havai Dezara, he says, is that I believe that there's something separate from Hashem. Dover nifred am separate miktu shaseh shalakadosh baruch hu b'chvay I believe there's something separate from Hashem's oneness. So now I finish the class, I want a compliment. Who needs that compliment? God wants the compliment? <laughs> so there's an I that decided it's separate, and now can you please fill me? He says, that's the source of Avedi Zara. That's the conception of Avedi Zara. And that's what Gasa Saruach means. Gasa Saruach is I'm trying to bring attention to something that doesn't really exist. Now we might think this is a very tall order. Who are you talking to? But the truth is, it's not a total order, it's a natural order. This is the organic state of our soul. Holiness is not something new. Holiness is you. You are holy. I am holy. We are holy. We are infinite. That's what the Rambam says when a person lets go, when I let go. And sometimes we need a lot of help with this. Because if I'm trained 50 years to think a certain way, I'm not just going to let go unless, and this is where the problem is, spirituality could be another form of narcissism. It's a very sensitive thing, but my coping mechanism could use religion and God and spirituality to feel good about itself. Like now I'm going to give up my ego, but I'm so angry. <laughs> whenever I give up my ego and I'm angry, I did not give up my ego. Generally, whenever I'm going to be the nicest husband in the world to my wife, but I'm feeling anger, this kindness. There's something off. Because if it was really coming from the soul, you're not angry about it. If I'm compromising and compromising and compromising, and I became the tzaddik hadar, and I'm going straight to Gan Eden, but I am so angry. <laughs> and the moment my wife says something that triggers me, or my daughter, or my son's agenda trigger triggering me, I implode. I don't explode because I'm a tzaddik. You know that. So I don't explode, but I implode, I'm angry. But I'm not going to be angry because I'm a tzaddik. So nobody knows it, not even me. So I'm now repressing it, but I am so passive-aggressive. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? 
Well, we are. We're, we're, we're fool, we're fool, we're, we're, we are we're trying to do the right thing, but we're doing it through the tools of trauma. We're doing it through the tools of ego. Really relinquishing control is a very blissful and liberating experience. And it's not intellectual. We learn. I've learned, I've learned these stuff my whole life. I grew up with this information. But there's information and there's experience. It's called Das. For Adam Yada is Chava. Das is visceral experience. It's a completely different thing. Information could be detached. Artificial intellig- intelligence knows more than any one of us. Google is the biggest Talmud Chachem in history. But when I see Google, I don't stand up. You didn't like my joke. Okay, it's fine. You understood what I said? A Talmud Chachem walks in, I stand up. Google, I don't stand up. The point is, information is not the issue here. Information is the beginning and the genesis. We Jews have so much information, and today especially, there's so many classes about everything. And it's great, and it's awesome, and it's a tremendous bracha. A regular Jewish woman today is, edu- ask your great-grandmother how she was educated and how you're educated. We're also educated with other stuff. But the point is, huh? But she had connections. Yeah. They were plugged in. Huh? Not information, but connection. Yeah. Yeah. There's information... And then there's the actual experience of it. The experience of it, of relinquishing the need to control. Not as a form of suicide, on the contrary, as a form of life, the death of ego. It's a very, very deep experience and it comes up in the smallest moments of the day and the night. It doesn't look like a colossal victory. But inside that space, that's where Avas Hashem lives. Because when, this, when more I'm open to that experience of the soul, the soul is a channel of Hashem. And Hashem is the source of Tainug. Ein Saif is the infinite bliss. And again, that bliss doesn't mean that we understand everything in the world. We don't. We can't. I am not Hashem. None of us are. And the pressure to be Hashem and understand Hashem makes us also miserable. But I'll tell you who you are. You are a chelek alekami ma'al mamish. We are a derivative of that infinite consciousness. And that infinite consciousness just means I'm never going to unplug from the source of love in the world. And when I see so much pain in the world, all it means is that the energy is being interrupted, so I'm going to plug myself in much more. I'm going to become a greater channel for, for, for gratitude, for love, for connection. And when I need to cry... I cry because I'm not crying because I don't believe in the connection. I'm crying because I experience the bliss of that connection. And I want that bliss, that light to fill the world. When we ask for Mashiach, it's not like a Chiddush, a Jewish soul yearns for Mashiach. What does it mean? You want that this truth should fill the whole world. That's what it is. I want this truth should fill the whole world. Malahar, it's Deyes Hashem Kamayim Le'amachas. So I Erechayim says you have to understand Nadav and Aviyu went very, very it was intense. They went all the way and they went so far the soul was so in touch with infinity the guf does have a container. It's like so much electricity and the voltage was too intense. They expired. And Erechayim says they were happy. <laughs> they were happy. They, they, they knew this. They said, yeah, we're good. I, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm only afraid of death when I'm in a place of ego. When a person is the Ein Saif, what are you afraid of? Becoming infinite? Electricity is not afraid of unplugging the refrigerator. Do you think electricity goes crazy when you unplug the refrigerator? You know what electricity does? He says, bye-bye. See you later. I'm going back to the source. The soul is divine electricity. It's not afraid. Not even of you weren't afraid. Why do we call it a sin? We call it a sin, not because they were sinful people. You know, there are ugly sins and there are holy sins. We call it a sin because the objective of Hashem was Diri B'Tachtoyna. The objective of Hashem is to be able to channel the infinity into the finite, the soul into the body. To be able to experience this oneness within my guf, within my nefesh hamamas, within my animal soul, within the sitra achor, within the klipa. To create, create fusion between heaven and earth. So now let's come back to the story. <laughs> this is the story. This is what happened. 
And once we understand this perspective, we see exactly what Purim is really. The first thing Rav has said is a person has to be intoxicated on Purim. Ad the law yada till you don't know. What's that supposed to mean? Who's not supposed to know? You don't want your children to know the difference between Arar Haman and Baruch Mardechai. The whole Yiddishkeit is based on Das. There's good, there's bad, there's light, there's darkness. There's cruelty, there's kindness. There's wickedness, there's righteousness, there's good, there's bad. I mean, come on. So people at face value say, yeah, Purim is just this wild day, just get drunk. Chas it's the exact opposite. Yom Kippur, in a way, is not as hard as Purim. How can you say that? People don't get drunk on Yom Kippur as far as I know. They take it very seriously. So Purim is actually a much more serious day. It's so serious that we don't have to be serious. <laughs> Yom Kippur is such a powerful day, I don't have to be serious. What do I mean I don't have to be serious? Not because it's not serious. Because it's much more serious. It's a day of Adel Yada. The person has a kayak to go out of Das. The person has the ability to be able to go out of the modes of trying to grasp and understand reality. Rabbi and Abzeda made a meal. Ifsum. They became inebriated. What does it mean they became inebriated? It says about Nadav and Aviyu, They went into the base of Mikdash drunk. Asked the Shalod. Nadav and Aviyu were simple alcoholics. And then Moshe told Aaron, they're holier than you and I. Really? Drunkards? They'll go into the Mishkan? Drunk? They're holier than Moshe? Suya yayin means, like we say, Nichnas yayin yotzasoit. Person drinks wine, secrets come out. There's inebriated, I must a shikr, I'm a drunk. There's inebriated mean, I lose my sense of ego, my self-consciousness. You see, sometimes a person drinks, and I'm talking about a person who's, who's mature and, and, and spiritually refined, and I let go of stuff. The ultimate suya yayin is the ultimate death of ego. Ra- Rabbi and Abzai, when they were sitting at the Purim Fabreng and at their Purim Suda, it wasn't just alcohol on the table or wine on the table. What was on the table was a flow of godliness, a flow of Pnimius, of Pnimius Atayra, a flow of the greatest secrets of Torah, the experience of divine infinity. Come, Rabbi! Rabbi stood up! What do you mean he stood up? It's not just he physically stood up. Rabbi was elevated to a completely transcendent space. Now, what's the name Rabbi? What does Rabbi mean? Rabbi means large. What does Zaira mean? Small. Why are those their names? Rabbi and Zaira. Rabbi's vessels were so large that even with that explosion of divine bliss, his body could contain it. Rabbi Zaira, from the word small, when come Rabbi, when Rabbi stood up and lifted him up to that space, it was so overwhelming, it was so intense. Shocked the Rabbi Zayda. Slaughtered Rabbi Zayda. What does the word shachat mean? That's a very nice addition. Thank you. <laughs> very nice. It's actually nice. <laughs> what's what's shachta? What's shachta? The Gemara says in Maseches Chulin, in the tract dedicated to Shechita, Chulin Daf Lamed, Ein Veshachat Ella Umoshach. The word Shechita doesn't mean there's, there's people who shoot an animal or stab an animal. You're not allowed. It's called Nechira. Take a knife and stab the animal to death. That's called Nechira. It's possible. What's Shachat? Ein Veshachat Ella Umoshach. It's drawing. And that's why by Shechita, it's a whole different type. I'm not going to get into the details here. But the way shechita is done is drawing the knife backwards and forwards. It's a whole different form of, of, of death of the animal. Spiritually, what is that? Shachat means mashach, to draw. When a person shechts an animal, why does Torah allow shechita? If I'm eating meat or fish or chicken, just because I'm a glutton, who's, what right do I have? over the life of another animal? The answer is, Ein v'shachat elo moshach. The concept of shechit is moshach. It's drawing, meshich is to draw. To draw the animal from a place of animal, from the state of an animal, into the state of a human being. 
In other words, when I eat the chicken or the fish or the meat or even a fruit, there's a consciousness that's necessary and that's why we make a blessing. I'm taking an animal and elevating it and sublimating it, mashach, drawing it into becoming the human being who's now one with Hashem. So now the animal becomes one and the whole world becomes one. That's what a person does. We are the interlacing link between heaven and earth. If it would have said Kotle, you think the Bzeid, the Rabbi killed the Bzeid, he took a knife and stabbed him. Took a knife and shechted him. Took a stick and banged him over his head. The Bzeid says, no, shechted the Bzeid. What's that mean? We sh- he was Moshe. He drew the Bzeid. He drew him. You can't force somebody into bliss. He drew him. like He drew him into a different realm. Sometimes people who went on very deep spiritual journeys, emotional journeys, the person is in a different realm. They're literally in a different realm. All the protectors are gone. All those egotistical voices are gone. They're literally in a state of a higher state of consciousness. And what happens? The Bzeda's soul is touching such profound truth his body can't contain it. And literally, he has not a near-death experience, but an experience of death. The death of ego translates into the death of body. Rabba, who's Rava, his kalim are greater, his vessels are greater, he can integrate it. Reb Zayda not. So Reb Zayda passed away. But it doesn't mean, it's not a metaphor, it's a real story. But it's not because Rabba was a murderer or he stabbed him. This was a completely spiritual, transformational experience where the soul actually ascends the body. I want you to take a look in the Shalah. The last paragraph, Shalach, Chayla Tarsh, Abba Barsh, Tetzava, V'zehu Soyed Ma'amadam, Masechus Megillah, Rabbah, Shachta, Lerab Zayda, Besut, Sayayid, Ratzel, Loimar, Hafshotas, Hachoymer. He was divested from the material, Ke'inyin, Yisrael, Bahar Sinai. It says, by Har Sinai, Parcha, Nishmasan, the soul left the body, Ki Nichnas, Imay, Toicha, Saga, Gdoyla, because he went in with him to tremendous form of spiritual comprehension. And the spiritual comprehension was so real that Reb Zayda's soul left his body. Perhaps it's mamish what it says like Ben Zayma. The four people went into the orchard. Rabbi Akiva came out and Ben Zayma died. Or it says about Ben Azai, he died. Here he says Ben Zayma. There's different versions. Ben Azai or Ben Zayma. One of them died. Masha Dibri Balash and Shchita. So why does he say Shchita? It doesn't mean it's not a metaphor, it's literal. So Hashem would want to slaughter them in the midbar. What does that mean? It doesn't mean he slaughtered him. It's a form of death. But then he says something deeper. There's a food pipe and there's a windpipe. An esophagus and a trachea. The kana is the windpipe. You're familiar how it works? The kana is the windpipe. It's called the trachea. The veshet is the food pipe, the esophagus. It's where the food goes down. Ah? Huh? Yeah. Shechita, when we shech the behemah, we cut through, it's called both simon, and we cut through the kana and the veshet. And that cut with the knife is what causes the shechita, the death of the animal. So he says that something happens very deep. Mordechai represents the kana, the windpipe, the ear, the ruach, and Haman represents the Vesha, the food pipe. Shachtel Rebzeida means who nichnas b'shayre sharsha. He drew them, he drew them back to the source. In other words, he went back spiritually to the source of Mordechai and Haman. So shachta, he shechts, you shech the kana and the veshet, going back to the source of Mordechai and to the source of Haman. What does it mean the source of Haman? What does it mean the source of even a Haman down here, ultimately everything comes. Everything comes from a source. So if you take Haman all the way back to Shoyre Sharshai, even Haman, you're going to find the Gemara says, Haman mina Torah mina, and even Haman has a source in Torah. So it's half live a fella. What, does, what that means practically is sometimes a person looks at themselves and they see very, very lowly or horrible or, or crazy or insane instincts that I'm having. Like, like the Haman inside of me. If you go to the Shoyrish of it, if you trace it all the way back to the source, you'll see that there's actually something innocent that was distorted in your perception. And for survival purposes, I became my own worst Haman. So at that moment, Shachte, he lifted everything back. 
And a bzeda's kalim didn't contain it. Zeta means small. And that's why it says come. And that's why it says shachte. Rabbi had the time of his life. You know who else had the time of his life? The bzeda. This was incredible. The tainug, the bliss of an ashama, uncontained, is unbelievable. It's, as I told you, take all the love in the world and bring it into one person and that's only a fraction of a fraction of the bliss of the soul without containers. That everything we have is a filter of a filter of a filter. Nobody was alarmed. <laughs> Nobody went crazy. But, Rabbi knew, <laughs> we don't want a bzeda there, we want a bzeda here. <laughs> so, Lamachar, Rabbi said, okay, let me daven. <laughs> it's not the bzeda's time yet. And what happens? The bzeda is alive. Wow. Yeah. He had Nadevan Aviyu. He had my love Nadevan Aviyu, but without staying there. He brings him back. He davened and he brings it back. Even if you want to say, the, the, the Shalom himself struggles, right? The Shalom says, uh, uh, In other words, you could say, it was such a faint, like a comatose state, where it looked like the body was lifeless. Or perhaps, and that's the literal interpretation, Shachte, he passed away. But how? Because of the revelation of the divine infinity. A year passes by. Rabbi comes to the Bzeda and he says, What do you say? Wow. What a schus we had to touch infinity last put him. Let's do it again. We'll talk. We'll, we'll get into that place of Neshama. That's what the whole drinking was about, is about. We'll get to that place of suya yayin nichnesul amikdash. If sum, that's why it says they both got intoxicated. It's not about rabbis drunk. It's both of them went into a place of adalayada. Let's do it again. The bzeda says, "You know what? I'm game. That was the best experience of my life. It taps off. Everything else is like you know a play. A play. Everything else is uh, huh? Charles play a sandbox. But there's one problem." <laughs> Lav bechol shaita v'shaita misrachish nisa. To con- here's the key the Rebbe said to convince an neshama once it's up there to come back down is very difficult. We don't look at it that way. We're not supposed to, because our avoid is in this world and we cherish every moment and we do anything to save a life. But once an neshama is stripped from any form of ego, it got to be crazy to go away from that. <laughs> Again, it's very hard for us to wrap our brain around that because please, do me a favor. But that's the truth of the soul. And it's important for us to understand that. This world is a place of challenge. The bliss the soul experiences in its oneness with Ain Soif without any limits is beyond what anyone can even understand. Like the Erechaim says, he can't even describe it. The fact that the Erechaim says he can't describe it means he understood much more than we think than he's, he's telling us he understood. <laughs> you know, when somebody says, I can't tell you what it is. If you really don't know, so don't tell me you can't. Erech, obviously, the Erechaim had a Pesachergish here. But there's still levels and levels and levels and levels. Even if has this in the next well, he may have to go through the cleansing. Somebody, somebody, but that's the whole point. The point is, the bliss is there. It's just if I have... Just like in this world, I can have so many layers. In the next world, they don't know, the, the, the neshama can't deal with layers. I have to go through the cleansing of removing the layers. Think of Gehenna as cosmic, the most intense form of healing. Of, of, of healing where I'm spitting out all of my dysfunction. It's, it's painful, but it's not bad. It's allowing the soul to go back to its pristine glory. When we speak about the punishment of Gehenna, I don't want you to hear it in traumatic ways. It's like Gehenna, Hashem is out to get me. That's not what it's about. It's about the fact that there's a very serious hierarchy. I am infinity. And when I'm contaminating who I am, the soul is hurt. The soul need, need, needs to come back to itself. I need to, if I have the most beautiful, I'm forgive my example, of the most beautiful suit in the world, 
and it gets very, very heavily stained. I'm giving it to the cleaners, not because I'm trying to punish it, because it's a beautiful, beautiful suit, and I want to get the stains out, and I want to get, bring it back to its pristine glory. And it's obviously not the same metaphor. Suit is a few hundred dollars. The soul is infinitely priceless. But you understand my point. When we learn about Gehenna, all these things, it's not a, a, a fire and brimstone tyrant who's just waiting to burn everybody in this, in this uh, what's the, the Dante's uh, Inferno? <laughs> Inferno? That's not what we're talking about. You know, this barbecue, this grand barbecue, every soul is going to be tortured because you did the wrong thing. And not because, I'm not making light of it. I'm actually, I'm, 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 I'm saying we should, we should understand what it really is. What it really is is much more powerful than the threatening, uh, uh, the threatening negative form. Your students in the school is very important because a lot of girls, I get a lot of emails, they grow up in schools and it's such a scary thing. But the truth is, when you understand what it really is, it doesn't have to be scary. Not because it's not serious, but because the truth is the most powerful thing here. The truth is, the moment you know what your soul really is, and you befriend it, you know that betraying it is a very, very painful reality. It's a painful reality. It's not a joke. It's, 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 it's very deep. It's very infinite. It's really good. I mean, just think if you have a relationship with an unbelievable person, betraying that relationship is hurtful. It's going to hurt. Take a little innocent child who trusts its parents, and the parents, chas v'shalom, betray this child. Never mind if the parents are sick and they do horrible things. You look at it, that's, that's horrible. That's the Gehenna. The sin is worse than the Gehenna. <laughs> you understand? The Gehenna is just the, 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 the... Taking out the splinter is not the tragedy. <laughs> taking out the splinter is a good thing. It's the infection that, that's, that's the problem. The, taking out the splinter is good. How did I get into Gehenna? Why are we talking about Gehenna? Oh, yeah, 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 very good. Very good, very good. So once a neshama goes up, it's very hard to get it down. That's why Rabbi had to daven. Boy, Rachi had to daven the next day. It didn't happen, Stam. Lamachar, after he landed, he couldn't do it right then. He himself was all the way up. He just didn't die. Lamachar, the next day, he wakes up. It's time to put on tefillin. It's time to daven. It's time to get back. His wife said, it's garbage. They take out the garbage. Rabbi Rabbi said, how is the Bzeda doing? Oh, the Bzeda is in Gan Eden. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. We have to be here. He didn't go to a therapist and say, I'm the biggest murderer who ever existed. He wasn't the biggest murderer. He wasn't the smallest murderer. He was a Tzadik Kadar. He davened to Hashem and he said, this is not Nadav and Aviyu. We want Reb Zayda. Reb Zayda didn't finish his mission. The world needs to be enriched. Reb Zayda comes back. The next year he comes to Reb Zayda. My beloved friend. Put him is the day we can touch reality. We can go on a journey without ego. Say this is gewaldic. I would love it. One technical issue. And that is love bechol shaita b'shata mezachish nisa. This year my soul may say, you know what? It's nicer up here. What should I tell you? Chilin is that upcoming. And that's not what Hashem wants. That's what Hashem wanted. It would be my time. It's not my time. It's not what Hashem, it could also be that Abraham thought that Abzeda worked on himself a whole year because these people were always growing. So maybe now his vessels are expensive enough that he'll be able to deal with it. Abzeda said, <laughs> For you, maybe for me, and that's why Rabbeinu Ephraim says that the halacha of intoxication was canceled because he believes the story actually happened. And yet, most halachic authorities did not cancel the halacha. Because they were not afraid of a Jew getting drunk on Purim and, and chas v'shalom killing somebody. They understood that the story is of a completely different state. And I'll just conclude, when the Rebbe said this explanation, he told the story about the Majid Rebbe. It's a fascinating story about the Majid Rebbe. Remember he said, this is 1984, he said, the Majid the Zayde from the Heintika The Majid Rebbe then, he, he, I think he got sick then, he passed away a few months later. Maybe that's why he mentioned them. But anyway, the, one of the, the, Rebbe, the Majid Rebbe's name was Rabbi Yisrael Taub. He passed away in 1920. 1920. Tofresh Payal of Kislev. He's known as the Divrei Yisrael. Anybody from Majid 
the Divri Yisrael of Yisrael Talb. He was the first Rebbe of the Mudrids dynasty. He had to go through a surgery in 1913 in Berlin. They didn't have then, of course, the medicine and the anesthesia and the tools they have today. It was a very serious surgery, but they told him that they can't do it because they don't think his body will be able to handle the stress and the pain. So the Majid Serebbe Rebbe Yisrael Taub said, he's going to compose a nigin. You know, Majid has a tremendous gift for nigina, for melodies. I remember the Rebbe said, in Koy Choy Godel Ben Nigin, he had tremendous Koyach in Nigin in music. So he's going to compose a song, he's going to sing it on, this, on the operating bed. And when they see that he's completely immersed in the song, they should start the surgery. And the Majid Serebbe composed the song. And the song, the Rebbe didn't say, the Lama Rebbe didn't say which song, but in Majid, they say it was the song Ela Eskera. It has 32 stanzas. In Majid, they sing it only on his yard side, Yud Gimel Kislev, and I think Yim Kippur also. In Majid, they sing the song very rarely. And they did the surgery. And it, he was successful. In fact, he lived almost another decade afterwards. What does this mean? However we explain it, but this was a person who had that ability to go literally on a journey. Yes, beautiful. <laughs> Talking about music. You can even put on Ela Eskera, but you're going to have to sit for an hour. Ela Eskera. It had to be as long as the surgery, remember. Imagine. This was literally, this is what you call the death of ego. The death of ego means he went into the point that he wasn't having physical sensations. Another story he said was that Alter Rebbe, the Baltanya, was learning with Rabbi Avram HaMalach, the son of the Maggit. And when they finished, they saw the Alter Rebbe eating a bagel with butter. So he said, why are you eating a bagel with butter? He said, after the shear, he felt he's going to have clay sanafesh, his soul is going to expire. So he needed this food, not just a bagel, a bagel with butter to hold him down. So why didn't it happen to Rabbi Avram HaMalach? It's because Rabbi Avram HaMalach was called a Malach. He was an angel. <laughs> He was L'chathchile in a transcendent place, like Rabbi. But al Rebbe felt he needed a bagel with butter because his avoid was dafka integration. What do we learn from this? What's the conclusion here? Wow, it's pretty late. That Purim gives a person the ability to get closer, each of us on our own level, of course, to this space of Kam Rabbe Shachtel Rebzeda, where a person can truly live viscerally from a space where it's not my falseness that governs, not my externality that governs, but rather the deepest part of the self, which is Echad Yachid Umayuchid, which is always one with the source of all bliss and truth. Have a wonderful week. Uh-huh.